I am Saleh Malaika. I'm uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Al Baraka Investment and Development Company in Saudi Arabia, uh, one of the pioneering uh, entities in the world in Islamic banking and finance, which uh, has operation in um, about 30 countries of Islamic banking operation. Um, I joined Al Baraka, Al Al Baraka Group, uh, 10 years ago. And um, I did my PhD in finance and with the intention of being in Islamic banking eventually. Uh, I took interest in Islamic banking in the early 80s when the movement was uh, at its conceptualization and it's uh, the heat of the early movement. Uh, so it caught my attention um, being in the academic world and in business at the same time. Um, it caught my attention. I became an investor in the Islamic banks uh, and then I decided to uh, pursue uh, a career in finance uh, based on the um, modern financial theory but having in mind the Islamic banking at the same time. And that became a reality, alhamdulillah, with tawfiqillah, and uh, I joined Al Baraka in 1991. Well, there is a wealth of um, literature and a wealth of um, uh, activities under what's called Islamic economics uh, in the, uh, at least in the first few hundred years after the uh, uh, Prophet be, peace be upon him. And for some reason, you know, the Islamic world has um, retreated uh, during the um, last 600 years and therefore there wasn't much development um, after that. And now there is a comeback uh, in today's world with the openness and globalization and so on. Islamic countries are endorsing these uh, uh, economic uh, you know, uh, theories, uh, the open world and the capital market development and so on which happened to fit the Islamic uh, financial, uh, you know, theory. Uh, because Islamic banking is based on, uh, you know, freedom of wealth and um, the uh, openness. And uh, it enhances competition and it enhances, uh, you know, equitable trading measures. Uh, there are so many uh, measures and guidelines in, is in the um, uh, Islamic uh, jurisprudence which are pushing uh, toward values which uh, you know show a lot in the uh, uh, Western capital markets nowadays. I think the main reason is uh, the colonization of uh, the Islamic countries uh, by the Western powers in the late 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. <clears throat> and when, when that was over after World War II, um, it, the colonial powers have left an infrastructure in those countries they have colonized. And among the infrastructure, aside from uh, utilities and ports and airports and so on, which facilitated their, uh, you know, uh, their trade and uh, their uh, needs in those countries. They've also established banks there. So you'll find that the oldest banks, the oldest bank in Saudi Arabia, for example, was Saudi Hollandi, was the uh, Hollandi Bank, the Dutch Bank. Uh, in other countries as well, the the first banks that were operated in the Islamic countries were mainly from the Western world. Uh, after the colonial era was over, uh, there was an awakening among, you know, uh, a lot of the leaders in the community uh, that uh, this form of banking is against uh, the teaching of Islam, uh, particularly to uh, when it comes to interest. But there are many other values, as I mentioned earlier, in um, promoting fairness and uh, more equality and 
sharing risk and income and so on. So uh, there were many voices, uh, mainly in the 60s, uh, and those voices grew uh, more and more in the 70s, and finally they, they uh, culminated in establishing the first few Islamic banks in, the, uh, in 1975. Dubai Islamic Bank was one of the first, uh, and the Islamic Development Bank uh, also, which is an intra-government bank between the Islamic countries, and then in 1977, Jordan Islamic Bank, and so on. So the, um, the peak of that, uh, uh, starting these few uh, first Islamic banks, were between the late 70s and the early 80s, and that's when it caught my attention and I joined the movement later on. Yes, I, I believe that uh, in the United States, though the um, Muslim population is fragmented and dispersed over a large country and in many states, um, but because of the te technological advancements, the internet and the telecommunication and so on, it's possible now to reach you know, a fragmented market. So um, now more than ever, it is possible to um, to attract that niche market, which uh, by m many estimates is anywhere between five to eight million Muslims in the United States. Indeed, this is a very large market. If we assume that they have an average uh, uh, GMP per capita at 35,000, you know, by at least five million, that's, you know, um, you know, 170 something billion dollars annually of potential you know productivity so there is tremendous wealth in that niche market and i think it it will be viable it's a, it's just a matter of meeting the regulations in the united states uh, the united states has very rigorous uh, regulations it's one of the best in the world it's meant to protect the investors and to enhance the financial system and uh, i think the islamic banking can take advantage of that it just needs uh, an understanding of those requirements and meeting them. Yes, the awareness is always an obstacle. I mean, we, we, you can see that in the traditional equity markets and, uh, you know, uh, bond and stock markets, uh, where the lack of understanding can sometimes um, uh, affect the markets adversely. Uh, of course, in this case, the understanding of Islamic finance and, uh, and banking uh, is, is, if it's not well received, then of course it can uh, pose its own problems. Uh, but what these conferences that are happening, like the one of today and others, they are enhancing that understanding in the society. Uh, and uh, we are moving, we're converging, we're, you know, to, to more uh, coherent understanding of those uh, uh, standards in Islamic bank and finance and this has happened in any industry you know it, it starts uh, with uh, diverse concepts and understandings and then it converges as it grows Well, it is growing, and uh, I had a speech this morning, a keynote speech this morning, uh, which, was, which is quite lengthy. And um, uh, the summary is that the globalization is helping Islamic banking to grow in the Islamic countries themselves. And the reason that this is true is because uh, most of the Islamic countries do not have regulations for investment banking. They only have regulations for commercial banking. Uh, and they have um, less developed capital and financial markets. Um, most of these markets know only uh, stocks in uh, very small uh, amounts. Yeah, a typical market will have 100 companies, 200 companies, or 300 companies, except for Malaysia, which has a larger number. So um, as the globalization pushes it its way and the World Trade Organization uh, you know, takes a center, uh, stage in the world economy, 
the Islamic countries are going to uh, adapt and open their markets and regulate. And by these regulations, it's going to encourage Islamic banking uh, and finance to grow in these countries. Uh, I have cited uh, many countries that uh, are advanced in endorsing Islamic banking like Bahrain, Malaysia, Sudan, uh, Pakistan and so on and some other countries which are uh, considering seriously uh, adapting its system to, uh, um, to fit with the uh, Sharia requirements including Islamic banking and finance like Kuwait for example. Uh, many of the uh, Islamic banks that are onshore in, uh, in the Gulf countries for example are growing at double digit rate and uh, they enjoy uh, a nice uh, niche market there. In some other countries which are uh, suffering from economic uh, difficulties, like in Turkey, for example, there are six Islamic banks. Of course, they are going to suffer like the rest of the banks in the country. So um, the Islamic banks are subject to the economic environment they are in, if they are onshore. If they are offshore, uh, the offshore is not really a very big market, uh, so it is not expected to grow in a large way. Uh, that leaves the uh, minority Muslims in the rest of the world, like in the United States and in many countries in Europe and uh, some parts of the Far East and in South Africa, for example. And in these markets, I believe the U.S. has the highest potential and can set a very good example. If the Islamic banking uh, movement proves feasible here, it is possible to extrapolate that experience into Europe and into other uh, parts of the world. From that point of view, I mean the world is, is, is moving toward more openness. Not the Globalization is an economic phenomenon. But what you are talking about in terms of the uh, dissemination of information across the world this is due to the advancement in technology and telecom and uh, regardless of the globalization it's happening because with the satellite uh, telecommunication becoming so cheap and abundant and also the fiber optic uh, cables around the world and so on <coughs> and the um, emergence of the internet the dissemination of information is available everywhere whether it is uh, negative information or positive information um, it's up to the individual countries to, um, to regulate, to uh, reduce the impact of that openness, but they cannot control it 100%. And you have to admit that there is no way that you can control uh, everything because accessibility is there. If someone wants to access information, he can get it. Now, I always believe that um, one of the greatest things about the Islamic uh, religion is that it works to uh, regulate the Muslim from within more than from outside. I mean, it, it works from within. Uh, and of course, we're all human beings and that cannot work perfectly with everyone. But at least in a, in a major way, we know that uh, praying five times a day and doing it in Jama'ah and the Jum'ah and the fasting and, you know, all the uh, sunnah and uh, the hadith and all these facts push the Muslim to, you know, to have uh, a way of life which is going to keep him away from, you know, indulging into such things. But it's still the responsibility of the governments to not to make something like this available, you know, in public. But if it is accessible, there is no way that you can stop it. But you can at least stop it from becoming, you know, accessible publicly. There are two types of riba. There is riba nasi'a, which is based on the um, money for money, which is for the, you know, the time value of money. I give you a loan and I ask you to pay, I mean, uh, a premium on it a month later or a year later. And there is no question that this is the riba which is haram. Uh, that, that is, you know, any form of interest. And then there is the other type of riba, uh, riba al-fadl, which is, you know, uh, which is not very well defined, but if you go to the literature, you will find that it is anything that leads to inequitable 
transaction, economic transaction between any two people. If there is an inequity in, in that transaction, uh, then it is a kind of riba. Uh, and that is not very well defined because it could be in many different forms. I mean, it, it could be, uh, you know, the derivatives today, it could be. So it is very difficult to define it, but it, you have to look at the, the, um, the fundamentals of that economic relationship, analyze it and see if there are elements which are inducing unfairness, uh, inequitability, and uh, sharing the risk and profit, then it, it becomes a kind of river.